Before I begin, the presentation is going to take about uh, 30 minutes to 45 minutes. And uh, I would like you to hold the question towards the end because the most of the question you people ask me I already covered later in the presentation. So I appreciate if you hold the question and I will answer it after the presentation, inshallah. So just to give you a little history of it, what this project is all about. That 10, 2010, about seven years ago, I had the open heart surgery. And I know that I was gonna go to the operation room and not, never come out again alive. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me the second life and I was back on my feet again. And at that time I said, I have to have a will. What's gonna to happen to my wife, my children, my relative and all that. So I start searching for the will all over the net and other. I couldn't find anything that will satisfy me. And then I started to learn about the Islamic uh, rules of inheritance. So I read about 16 books. Uh, all of the ones that were written by very highly qualified scholars. And I found out that the, that was so complicated that ordinary people would have no idea of what this is all about. So I took that and decomposed it into a very small, simple model that everybody can understand because from practical point of view, you don't want to be a scholar. You want to know how to write a will correctly. So there are two components of it. One is the Islamic inheritance law and the other in the state law of New Jersey. And that's the same for other states as well. So now when I start looking at it, I found that the two do not, they are not compatible. There are conflicts in between them. So that next six years, I spent on trying to find the solution. I have about five scholars in the United States who are working with me. And those people, whenever this Xfinity comes here, he spoils my presentation. He forces me to sign in. And I, when I cancel it, my presentation sometime disappear. Anyway, so when we have this uh, scholars, and I was talking with them and asking the very specific question, how am I gonna solve that? Because we live in a non-Muslim country, you must satisfy the Islamic Sharia rule for in inheritance, as well as the meet the criteria for the state requirement. Either one of them are not there, your will is not gonna be valid. So that was my challenge for the seven years to come up with that. And I have the people who have uh, helped me in putting a book together that I have brought the copies over here called the Islamic Will. And it has two parts in there, the Islamic Sharia law and the state law. And how do we make them to con compatible? More than that, the will in, in there is already approved by the scholar. And if you look at the first page of the book here, these are the endorsement from the people, such as the chairman of the Fifth Council of North America, Dr. Muzammar Siddiqui. Some of you know he used to live in Teaneck here a long time ago. He is in Orange County there, in uh, Islamic Center there in California. Then we have the chairman of the Sharia Council of ICNA, Islamic Center of North America, Sheikh Abdurrahman Khan. He is the only living person in the United States who knows the inheritance laws inside out. I was very really fortunate that I sat down with him and we went through line by line every page to make sure everything is correct. And he has been very, very humble and kind to help me with that. As a matter of fact, I wanted to go to him. He lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm in uh, Richmond, it's about five hours drive. But he says, no, I'm coming to you. And I said, Sheikh, I can come to you. Always the thirsty comes to the well. But he said, no, I want to be the part of what work you are doing it that nobody has ever done in the history in the United States. They don't have a valid will. So he helped me put together there. There are other scholars that are from the 1985 that I used to work with when uh, Isna was not there. I'm talking about MSAs of 1960s and 70s. And those people also have written where one of them is a notable person called Dr. Manzar Kahaf, that he put the first Isna Islamic will together. 
But from 1985 till now, nobody updated it. Lost of Islamic Center, a copy from the ISNA website, they modified it and they lost the thing that makes it a valid will. It's become invalid because they introduced things by themselves. So let me go uh, and start, get it started. Yeah. I, I have five questions. This is what is the bulk of my presentation. And the first is, why do you need an Islamic will? Can you live without it? The second question, what happened if you pass away, if you die, what's going to happen to your uh, estate, your wealth, your assets, and all that? The third is, what is the Islamic law of inheritance at a very high level, so you can understand, comprehend, okay, where are the sources, where are they coming from, so you can have the validity of a Islamic inheritance in the will itself. And the fourth one, which is the most hardest one, is what are the conflicts between the Islamic and state laws and how you reconcile the differences. And the final one is with the end, is how do you write an Islamic will which will comply with the Islamic law as well as the state law. I hope that will cover most of the question. If not, then we will give you that. So the, why do you need an Islamic will? Like, uh, other sort of commandment in the Quran that we are very familiar with, that we need to do salah, we need to do fasting, we need to give zakat, and we have to do the uh, hajj, all that. Many people don't know that writing a will is also mandatory. And let me show you why, because I'm going to give you the references now. First of all, that the three verses in the Quran, and they come gradual. Gradual means that the completion of inheritance was not in the first one. What happened at the time of Jahiliyyah, before the Prophet Sallallahu that the women get no share. It's only the male, the fighting force of the tribe, that they take all of the inheritance. So much so that if somebody's husband died, the woman becomes inheritance herself. And that was the kind of evil in the society. So here they uh, try uh, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the first verse and he's wanted to make sure that people gradually understand what it is. And first thing is in, in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 180, and he's saying that when the death, death or month approaches you, you need to have a will. And in the favor of your walidain, you know, mother and father, and your akraban, your relative. No mention of anything else. No mention of woman over here. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the wisdom how to approach the human being so they can understand. Because it's so much engrossed in the society at the time that they're not going to take an overnight revolution. It has to come slow. Just the way the forbidden of alcohol came in three verses. Same way it is introduced over here in the inheritance. Then comes the uh, Surah in Nisa, ayah number seven. And here, that breaks the uh, thing that they were used to. There is a share for a man, there is a share for a woman. The share for the woman, they never heard of it. So the first time, this was introduced in the Quran. And the fourth is the Surah Nisa, ayah number 11, 12, and 1, and 176. In there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid down all the rules how to distribute your wealth in your will. Now, it's not up to you to decide who gets what share. Lots of people have argument that it's my money, I can give it to anybody I want. Well, of course, that's true in the secular society. When the secular society, somebody died in a non-Muslim, and I read in the newspaper and heard in the uh, media also that this man was very rich and he died and he left millions of dollars for cats and dogs. That's okay to do it. It's in our favor. Now, if, we can, if they can do the, uh, the cats and dogs, we can take the Quranic injection from the Surah and Nisa and then put it this way we want it. So that is the basis. Now, the 176, as you can see in Surah and Nisa, 11 and 12 are together. Then it jumped to 176. 176 is the last ayah in Surah and Nisa. What it is, because what happened in the 11 and 12, all the relatives are covered. But there was one condition that they, they asked the Prophet Sallallahu What about Kalala? Kalala is an Arabic word, which means a person who dies does not have an ascendant or descendant. So how do you distribute them? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained that in 176. 
Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu was very worried about it because it is the time of Hijra 9 and Hijra 10 prophets is going to leave this world. So he wanted to make sure he get everything and learn from the Prophet And the Prophet says, if you want to learn something more, go to 176, the verses that were revealed in the summer of that year. So we have this thing here. Now, here is thing that makes even obligatory on all people. This came from Sahih al-Bukhari. And I give the full references in my book. I never quoted to say, this is in Hadith, this is in Bukhari, this is in Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, Nisai, Abu Dawud. I don't say that. I have to give the book of the Hadith, the chapter, and the Hadith number. If I can't find the reference, I don't take it. Because somebody may have copied it wrong, and I don't want to copy the wrong from other people. So just to make sure that I have, this is related to the Prophet this Abu uh, Abdullah ibn Omar radiallahu anhu report that the Prophet sallallahu said it is not permissible for any Muslim who has something to will to sleep two consecutive night without having the will written and ready beside him. There's a kind of any more stronger wording than this that makes obligatory on us to have this. It becomes more important to have a will here because we are not in an Islamic country. So there are uh, probate court laws will take over if we don't have a will. And uh, another thing is to look at that, how the Islamic will is going to protect yourself, you're going to protect your family, and you protect your children, protect your body and your obligation in future. Now some people are going to uh, worry about it when I die, how it's going to protect my body, or how it's going to protect my future. So. Protect yourself is that you have discharged your duty according to the Quran and the Sunnah. So you are now in compliance and on the day of judgment, Allah will not ask you accountable to that why you didn't do it. So you protect yourself. Then you protect your family because the family should get the share as is specified in the Quran. So you have appropriate a fraction of your wealth to go to the, the one that uh, I showed you in Nisa 4. Uh, 11, 12, 176. So, <coughs> the thing is the children. So the children is very important because if the children are under the age of 18, let's say, which is considered in this country as minor. So the minor children have to have some guardian. And the guardian has two types. The guardian who's going to raise your children give them education, if they're sick, take care of them, provide food, clothing, and everything. That's one guardian. The second guardian is the one who gets the money from the inheritance, who's going to manage the financial end of it. It's called the trustee of the children there, of money matter. In some cases, it's the same person. If, if, if it's not a big amount of wealth to be uh, inherited. Then you have, you protect your body. This is very important because in your will, you state, I am a Muslim. Confession of your faith in there. And you say that my body is not subject to any kind of embalmment. You cannot cremate my body. You cannot have unnecessary aut autopsy in there. So you have to have this coverage here so you protect your body even if you are dead. And if you know that the Rasulullah said that even a dead person handle with care. Don't break his bone or her bone transporting from one place to another. Then protect your obligations. We know we are all sometime and most of the time people fail to do our duty to Allah. So what happened? We are ready to go to Hajj, but we didn't. And the moth, the death comes all of a sudden. So if you have a will, you had specified there, if, if I die and I'm not able to perform Hajj, then somebody else will do on my behalf, called Hajj Badr. Also, sometimes you're very sick, and I know that the people who are diabetic, they cannot fast during Ramadan, so they give the fidya. And if you give the fidya, fine. But later on, if the uh, disease or the condition go away, then you have to fast. And the fidya you gave convert into sadaqah for you. So we have this uh, obligation, and you have obligation for uh, other things, like uh, you haven't paid the mahar. The mahar is a compulsory thing. Lots of people delay it, but they don't pay it. And another problem that they have is that they, 
Uh, I, I can give my example other than I don't know other people. When I get married, I say my mayor to my wife is going to be 10,000 rupees. 30 years later, $10,000 turned out to be less than $100. So she said, no, I want $10,000, not rupees. So I asked the Sheikh Abdul Rahman Khan, how do you address this problem? He says, it's very simple, $10,000 how much gold it could buy at that time, how many tola, how many ounces. And now find it out, the three or four tola that you can buy in, in, for 10,000 rupees, how much it's worth now, and that's the money you give it. So the, our sisters were very happy. <laughs> now we have some more money, which is in line with the uh, you know, cost of living and inflation. Then you have the future. How do you protect your future? If you're dead, nothing is going to go with you, except your amal, good or bad. That's the only thing you take with them, empty-handed. So this is the last opportunity in your will to secure your future. And I'll tell you now the story of here is appropriate. That Sa'ad ibn Waqqas got very sick. So the Prophet came to visit him. And Sa'ad said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to die very soon. I want to give all my money in charity. Rasulullah said, no, you can't do that. He says, how about two-thirds? He says, no. He says, how about one-half? He says, no. Then Sa'ad says, ya Rasulullah, what about one-third? Rasulullah said, okay, one-third. Even though it's too much, but it's okay. So one-third is under your control. Maximum of one-third is under your control. And two-third is Allah's control that Allah has already specified the share. You can't change them. So that's, that's what is your future is that you take some money and donate to this masjid or to the school or care or um, this uh, organization that are fighting for the Muslims right here, Muslim uh, Legal Aid of America and things like that. Because that's going to be serious of Qajariya because you're investing something that will come back again and again even if you are done. So I advise everybody that they write the will to give something to the Masjid school of your community or anyone else. You don't have to take all one third. You can take smaller than one third or nothing, but you have the control over it. Now this is an important thing is that what happened if you are not writing a will according to the Islamic law and you're not writing according to the state law. So we have a uh, thing that unjust will is, I took it from the uh, hadith book here, and the reference is given over here, that a person who obeys Allah for 60 years, when it comes to writing the will, he goofs. And Allah's messenger is saying the fire become binding on him. So it's very scary for us not to do the thing like that. Then there is a reward for just will. And this is a person for 70 years. He didn't do anything good. But when it comes to writing a will, he was very honest, fair, and just. And according to the Islamic rule, he did it. And Allah's messenger says, give him the uh, uh, news that he will enter the paradise. OK. That's the critical question now for us that we live in this country. What will happen if we pass away without a will? Of course, if you have no will, the probate court of your state will take over. They're going to decide who's going to get what. And not only that, they're going to decide many things that are against the law, against the Islamic law. And that means that the, the, it's not going to be according to the verses in Surah An Nisa. It's going to be according to predetermined formula who's going to get what. So the second other thing is that if you have no wills, therefore you don't have a guardian of your minor children. So they're going to appoint the guardian. The guardian could be a bad, it could be a non-Muslim also. Then the executor of the will, the court will appoint the administrator. That is going to take a very hefty fee and eat up all your wealth and the lawyers and all that kind of thing. So there is a danger in there. Then also we know that if there are no relatives, then Uncle Sam becomes my relative. <laughs> he takes all the money. So I am your relative now because you can't find anybody else. And the same way if you're living in Canada. By the way, my will is covering the United States and Canada both. There's a 50 states here and Washington, D.C. that make 51 
entities here. And in Canada, we have 13 provinces and three territories. There's 16 over there. And I have to study interstitial law of every one of that thing to find out what their requirements are. Later on in the presentation, we'll show you what the requirement by the state that you should have minimum in your will, inshallah. So you need an Islamic will, that's what I'm saying. I'm going to touch very briefly on the probate court because this is the court that takes over distribution of your wealth, your assets, your estate. It's going to go there. And they, they are responsible for assigning all, all the uh, authority for the executor or administrator how to dispose of your wealth according to their own uh, procedure. I do want to is, emphasize you one more thing. That is, there's a confusion over here about terminology. And terminology is because that's the way it is. I didn't make it up. This is how it is. You have a last will. You have a living trust. You have a living will. So you got, you got living and you got will all mixed up in three. Where we're talking about the last will is after you die. That is your last will. Okay. As opposed to the living trust is that in your lifetime you establish a revocable living trust. Okay. When you die, it becomes irrevocable. And when you become irrevocable, whatever is in the trust, that will, according to law, will be executed. Living will is very important. It is encouraging Islam very much. That if there are conditions when you yourself cannot make a decision because of your health, because if you are in coma, because you are on an artificial breathing system and all that, and you can't make a decision, then you have appointed a person called the healthcare proxy. Who's going to make a decision and say, look, I don't want to keep this person alive because uh, brainfully he's already dead. You're just pumping the air in, in his lungs, keeping alive, not only keeping alive, they keep uh, bills running up and up. So when the person dies, got to pay a lot of money there. So we have these three. Now, introduction to the uh, inheritance law. We, we're going to give you first the overview, what does it look like? And that, can you hold on your question? I have a question. I was hoping if you could just repeat what you just said between the three quickly, but I think it's clear in the mind. Can you just repeat that? Confusion is still confusing. This one? Yes. Okay. Last meal is that what we're talking about. The way you write, and you die, and you're wealth is distributed and you have a director for your funeral and your burial and your children and executed and everything in there. That's what we're talking about. The living trust is that in your lifetime, this has nothing to do with your death. You are alive and you want to make a trust. In the trust, you want to put all your wealth in it. When you put the wealth in there, you are still in charge of it. You can do anything you want with your wealth. But once you die, it becomes irrevocable. What are the contents of that trust is? That's what's going to be distributed. I advise people that who is going to form a trust instead of will. To remember, the trust and will are non-exclusive. That means you have to have a will even if you have a trust. The reason for that is that somebody forget to put all their wealth into the trust. Then you have a will called pour over will, which is catch all. So everything will go there and nothing will be left over for somebody to wondering what to do with this money because it's not part of the trust. And the last one we're talking about, the health directive. When we get sick, who's going to make the decision on our behalf? Is that clear now? Alhamdulillah. So after that, we were here on the overall view, a bird eye view, what the will look like. So disease has left some wealth, a state, right? So the first thing is your debt has to be paid. Liability, obligation to Allah. So that has to be taken off up front. Then if you have made the wasiya in your will that you want to take a portion of one third and want to give it to the masjid, you want to give it to the school, this is the place to do it. But you also can give it to the individual who are not entitled to receive any share, any share under the Sharia. If they don't receive any share, that you can give it out for one third here. This is a very powerful thing that I told you about, that one third is at your disposal to give anything. This, this one third is the hadith of Saad ibn Abi Qas, I just told you. 
is sitting there for 1,439 years. Nobody cared about it except Allah opened my eyes to say, all your problems in America that conflict with the state laws are going to be solved by this, Hadith. Alhamdulillah. And we show you how we're going to solve that. And the last thing you do is whatever is your remainder is going to go to distribution as stated in the Quran. So the sequence says, you pay your illness, your medical bill. Then you pay all your debt. It is very, very important you pay your debt. If you don't pay the debt, I'm going to show you what's going to happen to us if we die with some debt. The third thing is that you pay your obligation. And the fourth thing is you make a wasiya, how much you want to give it to the organizations as a charitable act. And remainder is going to be shared to go to your relatives, inshallah. That. So I heard it. Seriousness of the consequence of, of debt. If, if a person who is in jihad and he gives his life, all his sins are forgiven, except the debt is not forgiven. We live in a community, I'm going to send you that we are up to here in loans and debt. We have mortgages, we have car loans, we have credit card statement, we have other kind of money that borrowed for a personal reason and so forth. Some of the people have the equity in the home and they have a credit line. Equity credit line, we'll get more money, more, more debt. Everything is going to debt. So that's what it is. The soul of a believer is there attached to until the debt is paid. And Rasulullah, when he found out somebody died, he wanted to know if this person has any debt. And if it is a debt, who wants to pay it? If somebody pays it, he will perform the Salat Janaza. Otherwise, he says, I don't want to perform Janaza. Let somebody else do it how seriousness it is not to have this debt. So try to make sure that we don't have the debt in the first. We should spend what Allah has given to us. Don't follow the non-Muslim to say, hey, it's very easy for me to keep on borrowing on credit card and this and that. That's not the way for a Muslim. And at least Muslim living in this country, do not copy with them. So you have debt to the people I already mentioned. These are the list. And there could be other debts you have. So it has to be paid. And you know, at the bottom, our Uncle Sam is standing there. What about my share? You are in debt. You didn't pay the taxes. <laughs> He's going to always take a chunk out of your thing, whether you're living or you're dead. He wants to share anyway. Another thing I want to say to that, brothers, and tell the others that you have a fundraising, right? In the fundraising, people pay check, cash, and then they fill out a pledge form. The pledge form is a debt. Don't take it lightly, say, I don't have to pay it now, and nobody's going to follow up with me, and I'm not legally, you are re responsible for that. I already mentioned to you all the uh, obligation to Allah over here. The one thing you have to remember that I fail to find anywhere an authentic hadith that says that if you miss the prayer, you have to give the fidya for that. If somebody can point it out me, I'll be very thankful to it. Nobody has come forward and says, there is one hadith in there that one sahaba asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, well, uh, Ya Rasulullah, I miss my prayer, what do I do? He said, whenever you remember, pray it. <laughs> it's just easy solution. Don't have to wait until you die and try to give the fidya. And this also makes the sense. If we don't pray and we give the fidya for the salah, the rich people will say, I don't have to pray it. I'm going to give the fidya when I die. Well, that's not equitable. What about the poor person who doesn't have it? So it's not equality, equality and justice there. Now, here is the very overview of the inheritance law of Islam. The first category is called the Zulfurud. They are the one uh, known the primary hire. They had the preference over all other people. Their share is already fixed. We cannot change. Allah already said how much they're going to get it. There are 12 people in the first category. Four of them are male, and subhanAllah, eight are female. Just think it about at the time of Jahiliya, the woman was, didn't get anything, and Islam has elevated the woman so much that the paradise, paradise lies under the feet of the mother. Give her that. And before that in Jahiliya, when the female was born, there was a disgrace, and they buried a child alive. 
this, this is just a list of it, who are four male and eight female. The second category called asaba. Asaba is the male relative of the deceased. They don't have any fixed share. What is remain after paying the first category is distributed to the, this category here. They are all male in there, as, as I said. That. Then the third category is called Dhul Arham. Arham is a plural of Raham. And Raham means the womb of a mother. So anybody on the mother's side is Al the Dhul Arham. Those on the father's side is Asaba, the male descendant. And they usually get no share. The reason being is that the first and second category will absorb all, nothing left. But there are situations where the first and second category may not be alive in case of a Kalala. Then did this third category come into play. So in Islam, in a system, become a very comprehensive system covering all situations and not leaving anything to our own interpretation and decision making. Just the one, two, three, that same thing. Now, there are certain individuals they cannot inherit, and this is a comprehensive list of it. I said all step one, in laws, the people born, uh, they were not married legally in Islam, those children. Slaves, we don't care about that anymore. Although the physical slavery is not there, the mental slavery is still there because some Muslims follow the uh, Western ways, so they are slave in their mind, but not physically, <laughs> they're not chained. So we have this list of a non-Muslim. The last one could, uh, had been a very big challenge for me, that in inheritance of Islam, the, if a male Muslim married to a woman of Ahl Kitab, meaning the Jewish or Christian girl, they get nothing. Because the inheritance is in Islam is based on faith. And the Jews and Christians don't have the Islamic faith, so they don't get the share. So now, what's happened? If we write a will and not give any share to the Jewish or Christian wife, she can go to the court. The court says you cannot leave your wife out. I don't care whether it's Muslim, Hindu, or or whatever, he must get at least one third to one half share. I have a big problem over here. How am I going to satisfy this thing? So in my book, I found the solution, the four way you can solve this problem, depending on your own circumstances. One way is to that, remember the hadith of Sa'ad ibn Waqas, that you can take one third, give the share out of there, and you're okay with the state. Then some instances in some state will require one half, which is more than one third, then you can have something in your life where you're still alive to give it to your wife to make up the difference. The difference between one half and one third. How much is that? Any mathematic person in here? What's the difference between one third and one half? One six. Okay. So one six you can give it to her in our life and have her sign some documents so she will not come back after you, you, you're gone. The, these are some of the things that I already mentioned, and you already know these things are not eligible to receive it, and there's other ways. You take one third and, and give it to them so you've certified the state law. Then this, I want to show you that there is a, a law that says sim uniform simultaneous Simultaneous Death Act, USDA. First, I was confused when I look at the USDA and say, "What this United States Department of Agriculture doing here?" <laughs> USDA. I'm not buying any beef or anything. Then I found the definition. You go and look in the dictionary. There's a different. This acronym can stand for many things. So then I come up with this is the law, and the law says that if closely relative closely related relative die in a common accident like an airplane crash, husband and wife gone, and children or something. Who died first? You cannot determine. So how are you going to allocate the inheritance? And in this time, if you have three person, A, B, C, A dies, B gets it. When B dies, C gets it. When C dies, their relative gets it. When we die all together, who's going to get what she had? Okay. So, they made it very simple here in America to say nobody gets anything. <laughs> they, all this ABCD is going to give their inheritance to their own wife and children. 
there's no inheritance cycle going on. Fortunately, I found that um, Dr. Abdul Rauf, an Egyptian scholar who was also the Imam of uh, Washington D.C. Uh, in Washington D.C., and I personally met him in St. Louis, Missouri, in 1972. He passed away. He wrote the book called Inheritance in Islam. And there he mentioned this thing that if people die together and we cannot determine who died first, is the same law as the state law. Maybe the state law has stolen from Islam, who knows? We copied from there. Then there is also a rule called 120 hour rule, which means if you have a car accident and one person dies right there on the spot and the second person dies within 120 hours in a hospital, they consider that as if they died together. Now that's not acceptable to Islam. Islam says if one dies and the other one survives for even for one moment, that person is entitled to get the inheritance for the first one who died. So we have a problem over here. Alhamdulillah, late at night, and this is where my working habit is because I was working with the people like um, Dr. Manzar Kaf, who is in Doha, Qatar. He's teaching over there, and I'm sending an email. It's daytime over there, and mine is past midnight. And uh, you know what happens when you get this habit of working uh, late at night and one and two o'clock, and you have the uh, other better half in your house who started to criticize that go to sleep. And you're, <laughs> you're not going to be healthy. So I, I found that one guy in USDA, and I wrote it to him, what is the problem? In Islam, it does not allow to have one in 120 hour rule. What do we do about it? That guy is a Jewish guy, is an attorney in this organization, USDA. And he said to say, he said, Dr. Maj, you can take a waiver. I said, what the heck is a waiver? <laughs> he said, waiver means in your will you put down, you don't, com you don't have to comply because the government says you don't have to take it. It's optional. So I said, send me all the references. I want all the correct references to put in my book. So the people who say where I get it, they can read it, the reference right there. So that problem was solved, alhamdulillah. So we have the same thing I'm saying. Either. Now, the, these issues over here are created by human being, Muslim. It's not created by Islamic uh, inheritance law. It's not created by the state law. So if, if a person comes and he says, I want to get married Islamically, in Virginia, I have the license to perform nikah according to the law. The court has appointed me to do that. And people call me to say, brother, I want to have nikah this afternoon. I said, there's a number of requirements that you have to fulfill, and I am obligated to follow up there. I want to know whether you're Muslim or not. You get married to a Muslim or non-Muslim, who the people are. Then I want to know, are you legally in this country? I need to know your photo IDs. I want to know that if you were divorced before, do you have the court document to prove that? And I said, there is no such thing in Islamic marriage that we perform and you disappear. And the woman is going to come after me and he said, I can't find my husband. You perform my nikah. Oh, where am I going to find him? So I'm not going to get into that situation. <laughs> Stay away from it. And this is the protection of the sister that they insist that we should have been married legally. Because what happened if they were married Islamically and husband died, they're not going to get any share because they, she can't prove that she's the wife. She can't even go to the court knocking at the door to say, give me uh, my share. Same way with the divorce. The divorce also, also has to be registered. I'm going to show this slide very quickly. It says that husband and wife and that's why on the map there is a wedding ring, husband and wife together. They own property. You find nine estate, which is really on, mostly on the west coast. They have a law that says no matter who paid for your house, no matter whose name is on the deed, husband and wife get 50-50. The other states say that's not fair. We need to determine who contributed what. In many cases, the husband is working, wife is not. So wife didn't contribute anything, so the court is going to decide is going to be 50-50 or 30-70 or 20-80 or what. They're going to decide that. 
But the important thing to remember this is that a bypassing the will first. What are the things that bypass the will? If you look at the structure, it shows that everything is passing the will. There's nothing left in the will. So you have life insurance, you have your retirement account, you have uh, some properties, and you have some bank accounts, all of these things. So I'm going to not get into debate of whether the life insurance in Islam is halal or haram. I'm not a mufti. I don't claim to be one. So don't tell me that. But I will answer you according to the inheritance what it says about the life insurance. So first, uh, let me go and show you this thing, the argument for and against the uh, life insurance. Those who say the life insurance is halal and permitted, they say it's like auto insurance. When you have a loss, you pay the premium and your loss is covered. So what's wrong having a life insurance? That I die is a loss, and you pay for my loss, okay? Those who are against is saying, that's not true. The loss you have in auto can never exceed the value of the car. Total loss. But in case of a life insurance, the policy and the premium that you pay is far less than $10 million policy <laughs> that you have written. So it's far exceeding that. The second thing, auto insurance is required by law. We have no way out. Life insurance is not dictated by the state that you have to have it. It's up to you. So you can stay away from it. But now from the inheritance point of view, this is true. And it says that everything that was in our position at the time of the death, it is my wealth. Life insurance policy comes after you die. So it was not in your possession. So we don't consider that as part of the inheritance distribution. There are issues with Social Security. And I put it in this thing because a lot of people have the question in there. The Social Security benefits come after your death. You didn't own anything. It comes to the monthly uh, uh, payment to your survivor as aid from the government. So it's not part of the inheritance. So working couple, this is a very important thing to figure out. For example, the sisters pay particular attention here because they are going to be in a terrible situation if you, the husband, do not take care of it before you die. Why I'm saying is that? Because according to inheritance law in Islam, if the wife has children, she gets one-eighth of your wealth. One-eighth of wealth is not going to be enough for her to make a living. If there is a house, are you going to take a one-eighth of the house? Well, she can't live in a one-eighth of the house. How are you going to divide that house into it? Maybe you can sell it, and you give her a one-eighth, and she can't even rent an apartment for what money she get. So that, that's kind of a problem over here. What I suggest, and this is all my suggestion is, has nothing to do against uh, according to law in Islam or state law. I'm saying you need to take care of your wife and children while you're alive. Make arrangement so she will not be in a very desperate and bad situation because the one-eighth is not enough. If she doesn't have your children, it's double, it's one-fourth, but that is still not enough. So I gave four solutions in my book, how can you handle the situation. One of the situations that I practically do myself, and I have done it legally, is that I have two property. One of the property I put in my wife's name, she owns it, it's not my, part of my inheritance anymore because I don't own it, it's hers. So she's not going to be in a terrible situation when I'm gone and not at the mercy of the state law or some other law. And there are other things you can do it. I have four or five other things, but because they're short of time and I want to cover this and get to the question and answer session, I'm going to skip and uh, you can read all this in, in the book itself. Now, a critical question. How do I write a will? Then we'll comply with the state law and it will comply with also the Islamic law. So state law, all of them, has some basic requirement. And these basic requirements are very easy to fill for. First one is that you have to be 18 years old in order to write a will. In special circumstances, you can be less than, less than 18. If you married overseas at the age of 16, this country will honor that because there is a Washington Convention of 1973 that says that all of these things executed in one place we honored in another place, one state to another, one country to another country. Because if you married overseas, 
and you want to apply for the green card, your marriage certificate in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh is good enough here. We're not going to require you to, have to marry here. So we have that. The capacity is that when you're doing it, you should be in the sound mind and free will. And I'm saying is that because this law is very good. When I get to 90 years old, I'm not in a sound mind. I don't know what I'm doing. So the will is required according to the Islam, according to the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar that you should not sleep more than two nights having a will beside you. So why wait until there that when you cannot even think and understand what you're doing? You have to be free will. Then it has to be in writing. But certain states will allow you to have holographic will, means handwritten. But I don't advise you that because if you want to make changes, you cannot write the whole will again in your handwriting. Rather have a computerized version of it that you can very easily uh, print it, make changes and print it out. Then you have, uh, you know, opening a statement. This is the far more important statement in the will. If you don't have this in the statement, your will is null and white. He said, this is my will. This is not account of my walima or <laughs> my marriage. This is my will and I revoke all the previous will, null and white. This is the final one. So you have to have that then you have to have at least one beneficiary. The state law says, why are you writing a, a, a will if you have nothing to give away? So you at least have one beneficiary in there. And then you have the uh, executor. This is the most important uh, person. He's the one or she's the one who's gonna take care of whatever is in the will and distribute according to that. Also be in charge of your funeral, your burial, everything that need to make arrangements is there. So you select that. My book has two chapter, one how to select the executor, what the characteristic, and have the guardian of the minor children, what kind of thing you want to look into that. Then we have also the witnesses. The witnesses are required in New Jersey is two, in some state there are three. So two witnesses have to be non-related. In other words, those who are already getting a share cannot be the witness because of the conflict of interest. So your brother-in-law can be, any Muslim in the community can be witness, anybody can be witness except those who get a share there. And then th the other thing is that the signature must be signed in the presence of each other. So you have witnesses, you have yourself, and you have a notary public. All of them has to be in the same room at the same time witnessing that I saw the testator sign this in front of me because they become witnesses in the court later on. Filing of the will is not required. It, would, it doesn't do nothing. It's not going to do any good thing because you file it in here, you're living, so I'm not dead, so the will is no good. I can change that will again and make up another one if the circumstances permit. Because if I'm married and I have no children, my, my will has no guardian. Now I, all of a sudden I have the children, so I want to include that and rewrite it. So you're not going to go back to the court and keep filing it. The court doesn't like that either. And if you do that, they're going to charge you fees for doing that. Nothing is free. No free lunches, okay, no free rides. So we have that. Now, what are the sources available to us? To me, when I started this in 2010, I extensively research everything that I can find on internet, in printed matter, in books, and everything else. So I, I have this, uh, this thing that the Islamic website, you can go and you find a will there. Believe me, that will is not a valid will. They copy from each other. They made the modification. The language is not the legal language. If language is not legal, it can be interpreted many different ways. So there is a legal way of writing a word that has only one and one meaning in the court of the law. Then we can buy in the stationary store a will, one page. You fill it in your name and he says everything I own goes to my wife or goes to my girlfriend. I don't know who you have. <laughs> but you can fill that out, that's it. But that's not Islamic will. So now you have another source online there are uh, legal websites where you can go and put in some information and they will charge you money and give you a uh, PDF file so you can print and, and you have will there. But they don't know nothing about the Sharia. They don't know the Islamic law. 
And then you can go to the lawyer. So the lawyer come in two categories, one who are Muslim and those who are non-Muslim. You go to non-Muslim, he's going to have no idea what are you talking about Islamic law of inheritance. You go to a Muslim lawyer, it's likely that he himself is not trained. He didn't go to the law school to learn the Islamic law of inheritance. He, he learned the law of the land here. So that's what his main living is doing the work or legal work here. So you have a problem with all of these sources. So now you may have the right choice. The right choice is the one that I have in this book. In this book there are blue pages. These blue pages are the total will, 16 pages of that. All you have to do is to fill in the blank. All the work has been done. It meets the requirement from the Sharia because the legal requirement. So the model that I have is here that you have first in the Islamic world that we have in this book is a preamble. Preamble is a confession of your faith that I believe in Allah, I believe in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the final messenger and so forth, all your beliefs. So people know that this is a Muslim person's uh, will. Then you also have directive how my funeral is going to take place. And I don't want to have any cremation of my body. I don't want to have an autopsy. I don't want to uh, hang my body upside down and pump something to get all the blood off the vein and all that kind of mutilation. You don't allow that thing. So you have the directive. Then you have your death and obligation. I already told you that how important it is that if you have a debt, you must pay. And this is the first thing you do. So if you have a will, you are protected. All of the hadith I talk about, the person who j uh, died in jihad, everything is forgiven, all the sins are forgiven except his death. So you take care of your head, then you don't have to worry about it. Obligation of Allah, whether you missed the hajj or you didn't pay the uh, mahar or you have some fidya to siyam and you have other kafara, you have to do that in here if you're not able to do it in your lifetime. I would advise that everybody should take care of it in their lifetime. Do not put it off for tomorrow. I was reading a book by Imam Ghazali, Ahya Ulumuddin, two volume there. He said this, the biggest weapon the shaitan has is the delayed technique. He will come and he say, you know, to do right now, you can do it tomorrow. Well, you, you, you're getting an education here, you can do your hajj or you're looking for a job or you got married, now got a wife and you know, all of that kind of thing. He's going to delay it for you. It also delays it for us. Then we have the time for salah, and the phone call comes and we pick it up. And sometimes the person on the other line will not let you go, and you're missing your salah. And you got to have this little thing that you have, everybody has it. This <laughs> little devil, I call it. That's a big devil, this is a little devil. It can distract you, many, many things. These WhatsApp messages are driving me nuts. <laughs> and they're sending me McDonald has a haram food in there. I'm not eating McDonald's food. Why are you sending it to me? I have a halal meat to eat. Why do I worry about it? They do that all kind of thing. So now, the next thing we have, assignment of executor and a guardian for the minor children. Then we have the bequest. Bequest is that one third that you want to give it to the organization. Inshallah, everybody will write a will here and, and give something out of it to this organization. Then the remainder will be distributed. So now, what's the solution? What's the end of it? This is the book. Seven years, day and night. I have no other profession, no other job working on it full time. Everything is worked out for you. There is a compatibility with the Islamic law, is a compatibility with the uh, state law. And there is a command from the Prophet Sallallahu that you should write your will and do not go to sleep more than two nights. Brother and sister in Islam, you heard me. It's going in the, written down in our book of record. Allah already know what we are doing here today. So you have no excuse for saying, I don't want to write a will. You have the means, but you also have the choice. Means is available here, the choice is you do or you don't do it. So this is what I want to do is that I bring the book here. If you go to a lawyer, it's going to charge you four or five hundred dollars easily, but it's not going to be an Islamic will because the lawyer doesn't know. Now, 
the price of the book is only $99. In $99, you get a fantastic book, which is approved by five scholar, which you spend seven years on it, and you don't need to worry about. You fill it out and put it away and go to sleep peacefully. A lot of people say, why should I pay $99 for this book? The books are selling in a market for $10, $15, and the paper and print, I said, the paper print is not a story book. This requires a lot of research and a lot of work in it, and it is intellectual property copyrighted. So you, it cannot be the same $10 book. You buy a story book or a children's book or something like that. So it is coming very, very, um, uh, what you call, inexpensive here. So, what it was that? So the, the, this is the book here. You, my information that how to order the book is there. You can buy now today here, or you can order by calling or sending me an email. I can do that. Another thing I can do for you is certain services that you are, cannot do it because you are too busy or you don't know how. So I can provide these services for a small fee. For example, if you want me to write a simple will, I'll charge $150 and do all the work for you. All you have to do is to sign it. All right? And if you want a book only, it's $99, you do it yourself. It's called like do-it-yourself kit. The third thing is the simple will and the book come together. So now it's, it's $50 cheaper for $200. I gave you both things. And then self-proving affidavit is very important. I recommend everybody to have it, but you, it, you don't have to have it. What it means, self-proving affidavit, that the people, two witnesses who sign your will, died, disappeared, moved, can be fined. And the court says, where are the witnesses? Well, I don't know where they are. So you have a self-proving affidavit signed by the same witnesses. You produce it to the judge, and he will say, no need to have a physical presence of witnesses. Affidavit is here. That's good enough. And then, if you have a complicated situation, I can do the consultation to you for a small charge because there is a lady that I'm working right now in Northern Virginia in McLean Islamic Center. She is a doctor. Her husband is also a doctor. And she has a very complicated will. A simple will not do it. So I said, I'll do the research. I have the access to the uh, think that you may not have it or you may not have the time. And then if you look at it, this book has another writer, Nadia Khan. And most of you already know who she is. If you don't know it, she's my daughter. She's a lawyer in Oak Brook, Chicago, Illinois. She has helped me in the legal side of it. So we are authorized to prepare will because under her attorney license, we can do that. I'm not attorney, but she is. So we can do it just like in the law offices. You have a lawyer and you have a paralegal. Paralegal doing all the work. The lawyer is picking up the money that the clients pay to them. So now I would like you to uh, come forward and see if you want this book. It's available right now here. You don't have to pay any shipping and handling. And if you want to order later on, there will be additional costs too. So this is the end of my presentation here. And There's a slide. Okay. The first question is you uh, indicated that you had given a house to your wife. Is that conform to the formula of one third? Or it does not? Very good question. The question is that um, the house that you transfer to your wife, is that has the formula of one third or not? I think I didn't make it very clear. What you do in your lifetime has nothing to do with the inheritance. Inheritance is only after death. So in your lifetime, you can give away everybody, anything to everyone. But I want to tell you one thing, and that is that there is a very strong hadith in Bukhari. It's called the uh, hadith of, uh, uh, what's the name, Kosher? <laughs> huh? No, 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 no. I didn't tell you that one. Yes. Noman Bashir. When Noman Bashir was a little child, 
His father wanted to give him some wealth, okay? So no one, uh, but she's, uh, mother says to her husband, I want Rasulullah to be the witness, so we know you're not going to take it back <laughs> later on. So Numan bin Rishi with his father went to the Rasulullah and he asked, Ya Rasulullah, I want to give this thing to my son, Numan bin Rishi here, and I want you to be the witness. The Rasulullah asked him, do you have another children? He says, yes. Then the Rasulullah asked, are you giving the same thing to the other children? He says, no. The Rasulullah said, I don't want to be the witness in an unfair, unjust thing. Go find somebody else to be witness. That means that when you are giving away in your lifetime to someone, and this hadith relate to the lifetime, that you have to be fair. The formula that the son gets twice the daughter's share does not apply in your lifetime. You can give it anything. In many cases, you may have your grandchildren, a granddaughter, or somebody very poor, and they're not entitled to any uh, thing in the, uh, what do you call the inheritance. Then you give it out of one third. Did I answer your question? Say that again. Huh? I didn't hear. I said that the Prophet passed away. The Prophet? Prophet. Yes. Good question. When he passed away, yes. He had, yes. He had a wealth. He had a property in Khyber and here and there, patches. How did he distribute his wealth while his one of the daughter was still alive? Okay. That's a very question, and this is not something that I didn't come I did come across this thing when I was looking into the book of our hadith. Then he says that the Prophet ﷺ has narrated the ahadith reported in Bukhari and other books. He says, we Prophet do not inherit our things to other people. It could not be giving anything. And that's what the rule when, uh, when uh, Ali and Fatima came forward and say, we want the share from, from Rasulullah He says, no, you don't inherit anything the Prophet. What you inherit from the Prophet is the faith. So the Qur'an is the one he's leaving behind. This is inherited you to follow it. And a similar thing happened in other uh, prophets in the history, such as uh, Sulaiman al-Islam and Daud al-Islam, that they didn't inherit each other, but they give whatever they left was the teaching of uh, following Allah Azza wa Jal. So it is very clear in the hadith that the Prophet himself said that his whatever he left behind, as a matter of fact, he didn't leave much behind. If you look at it, what in the uh, Sira book, you find out, you know, he was living, didn't even have a mattress or bed or anything else, sleeping on floor. And then he has just one room called his Hujra next to the Masjid al Nafi with Aisha radiallahu anhu with him. So that is the reason his wealth is not distributed to anyone. Do not, and the wife of the Prophet, nobody can marry them either. They become Ummul, Ummul Ahad Mu'minin, the mother of the faithful. You're going to have all the questions, you're going to give a chance to somebody else. <laughs> I'll come back to you. <laughs> okay, brother, go ahead. Here it is. For redundancy purposes, everything I have, like accounts, house, car, everything, I just included different members of my family. So, you know, so that God forbid something happens to me, at least they were covered. And when I did this, um, I was the only person who was assured of staying here in the States. How do you handle such a situation and how do you... Are you talking about when you are alive or are you talking about when you died? Once you die. Once you died, you can't do anything. You're dead. Okay. So. You have to do something when you're alive. Even you write a will when you're alive. Okay, in the will, you have to do exactly according to the Islamic law. It is not up to you to decide who's going to get what in your life, who's going to get the car, who's going to get the uh, TV set, and who's going to get the house and all that. Because all your wealth or your assets become your estate. And your estate has to be distributed according to the Islamic law. Um, second question. So let's say the money that you get from your 401k, that gets distributed to your primary beneficiaries. And I know in your slides you said that that's money that's received after death. 
say that money is in excess of all the uh, amount that you receive. In such a case, the one third that you have control over to give to anyone else, um, is there any suggestion on who should, who should receive it? Okay. I mean, you understand what he's asking. You're talking about the retirement uh, uh, or a pension like 401k, IRA, and all that thing. So these things require by law to have a beneficiary in your lifetime. Okay. Now, when you die, it's still yours. It's only going to go to the beneficiary after you die, not before. That's what it means to having a beneficiary, whether it's a life insurance or 401k or other accounts, right? So now the question is that Islam says that everything you belong is yours. You cannot give it away to a beneficiary. So it's a conflict with the law. In my book, I told you how to avoid that. There's a four way you can avoid that thing. One of the simplest way, which is not really legally binding is you write a letter of wishes. And I gave a sample in there, the wording in there, in the book. It says that if certain thing goes like 401 gate, go to my wife or my children. They, you write them a letter to them that after die, put that money back into my state. It's not yours. Because legally, you have the, uh, what do you call the, uh, yeah, it's the person who is getting the money because it's stated by law, but it's not yours. So you put it back there, and I have four other ways to do it. A lot of, lot of things you can do uh, is you have a, a prenuptial agreement, you have a postnuptial agreement, you can have a legal agreement in which you agree that this money is going to go to your estate rather than going to someone else. If you have a property and you are uh, survivorship clause in it, then once a person dies, the survivor person takes all. That's also not allowed in Islam. So you may have to take care of that to change the uh, ownership of your property. I have the tenant in entity rather than tenant in common or tenant with the survivorship. Change that. Then when you die, your portion goes to your estate and the other 50% goes to your spouse. Yes, sir. Okay, the question is, who's supposed to write the will? Both. Husband and wife are supposed to write their own will. The reason is, the husband and wife may have assets, their own, okay? So, and they also have their own relative. The only thing common between husband and wife are children. Their parents are different. If they have the same parent, that means they're brother and sister. <laughs> And they're not husband and wife then. So you need to have a separate will for the wife and for husband. So when a husband died, it goes to the wife. And the wife has to write a will. Where is it going to go? To their children and their parents and their siblings. Yes? What happens if you don't have relatives here and they are back home? Okay. If you don't have the relative here and you have it back home and they are entitled to receive a portion from your inheritance, which is in your will, your executor is going to take care of that. That's why we have the executor in there, that he is in charge or she is in charge of doing all the work. I usually say that, not putting the sisters down, I said, appoint a male because he can deal with the court and legal matter and is selling the property and distributing all that. But some sisters are very smart lawyers and all that. They can handle themselves. So you can appoint a male or female executor and that will take care of that your relative overseas. Because in the will, you already have their name and addresses. In my will, you write it, write it down, everybody who gets the share, what's their name, what's their addresses, and how much they get. And the executor will follow up your wishes there in the will. So the address does not have to be in the United States? So the, the relatives could be outside the country? Also. Yes, the relative could be anywhere. Yeah. They don't have to be present here. Uh, the expenses for the execution, how does the executor get it? 
Or how should he get it? Okay. The, the assets that you leave behind after that, you can take the expenses out of there to pay the executor. Even if you don't have a will, the court will appoint an executor, and the executor will be get paid from your, uh, your wealth. So same way as there. But I found in practice that a good Muslim does it for free, sabillah, for sawab, for reward from Allah, doesn't charge hefty fees. So you got to select a person who is not only capable, willing, and be able to do the work for you. So you just can't draw a, a name out of the hat and say, he's my executor. No. In my book, there is a chapter, How to Select a Qualified Practicing Muslim Executor and give all of the classification there. And the same thing is in a chapter in there on the guardianship. Now, what you looking in a guardianship person? Sister, sorry, I, I got to go this way. <laughs> Take, take this thing because people cannot hear Sorry. your question. Um, we have a relative who said that they don't have a will because writing a will is expensive. Um, and they said that they had everything already written down, everything documented, who will get what. So is it automatic that without the will, everything goes to probate court? Or if this person has everything documented, would it be different? Okay. Your, your question has two parts in it, and I want to clarify that before I answer you're saying your relative already decided who's going to get what, yes. which means they have a will. If, you, if they read it, write it down, who's going to get what? That is your will. But that will may not be a valid will because you do not follow the state uh, laws. Okay? Second thing is that it's not up to you to decide who's going to get what after your death. And like I said, one-third you can decide on it, but two-third already decided for you by Allah Azza Anyone? So that, that, that this person should make sure that, I mean, legally everything is, my, my question is, would they have to see a probate court because there is no one document or? See, this, this is what the whole thing is about, that when you write a will, you need to be sure in your mind the will you are using a meeting the Islamic requirement, is meeting the state requirement, it is being endorsed by the scholars in this country, and the lawyers agree on it, this is the right way to do it. You can write your own will, but I doubt it that's going to be a valid will. But you have to have a valid will here, and if you can find a valid will, good enough. You use that one. But I don't know any will in America that covers all the topic that I talked to you about it. And we are presenting you that you have a solution ready-made for you with the least amount of effort that you can fill it out and have your religious obligations satisfied by having a will beside you and sleeping for two nights. Well, we already been sleeping many nights, we didn't do it, but that's forgiven because khata mean mistake and, and, forgive, and, and forgiveness is, yeah, Allah forgives when you make a mistake or you forget. So if you didn't know it about writing the will is necessary in Islam, now you know it today. So what you do today is what it counts. What you didn't know before, it doesn't matter. Oh, I already had that slide there. Let me go back. This, this is what my schedule looks like. Depending what, you, depending what you want me to do is here, God, this must be the Xfinity territory that interrupt all the time here. I don't know why it's happening here that they want me to sign in. I have press the cancel button or turn off your Wi-Fi. I don't have a Wi-Fi. That's what he's trying to find. It doesn't have a Wi-Fi in there. I'm not connected to Wi-Fi. Any Wi-Fi. That's why he's saying you don't have a Wi-Fi. Xfinity comes in there. They did it on purpose. They want you to go and buy the cable TV from uh, Camcast. Xfinity is their brand name. Okay. What, what was the question? 
Hold on. Yes. Filing of the will? Yes. I say not necessary. Okay. So you can keep that so okay. can keep it uh, with you. What you do is that you make three copies of your will. Okay? One copy is with you, the writer. And usually you put it in the bank's safe deposit. Make sure that somebody else has the access to it because when you die, the bank will not let you open the, your safe box. Mm -hmm. So you want to have somebody else the access. Otherwise, you have to go to the court get the just permission to open the box. The two other copies, you give one to the executor, and one, you give it to your spouse. I say spouse because you are a husband, you give it to wife. If it's a wife will, you give it to husband. What kind of question is this? Please sit down. <laughs> the sister wants me to sit down. <laughs> Am I bothering you? <laughs> Okay, are we done with the question? I'll sit down. I was holding this and making a noise over there, so I didn't get the whole question. I said that when I went over the state law, those laws are for all states. So whatever is in there is common yes. for all states. Yes. Yeah. There may be complication on a weird situation, but that not applicable to Muslims. Because we don't follow everything, the letter of the law. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> I, I have a question. I have a question. I have two children and two properties. तो एक महंगी है जो मेरा एक बेटा है वो मेरे साथ है तो मैं कैसे बांटूंगी क्योंकि जिसमें मेरा बेटा रहता है वो उस मेरे साथ वो कीमती वाली है और यहाँ बड़ा बच्चा रहता है वो सस्ती वाली है तो क्या बेस्ट होगा इस्लामिक ब्रदर सिस्टर इस्लाम यू गेटिंग इनटू वेरी स्पेसिफिक क्वेश्चन ऑफ योर सिचुएशन I'm only giving you the answer with the general nature for everyone. So if you have a situation, then you can, you know, engage me in consulting and find a solution for you later on. But I cannot give you all the answer here in this session. Thank you for your understanding.